You never know if it could change your life. Take a chance, you need a wrong or right. You never know if you're wrong and dice. You better roll in dice. You never know. Oh, there's some new subclasses from Unearth. Oh, that's what it was. I yeah. I remember. I, I kept meaning to mention this to you. Uh, yeah, Unearth Arcana, and there's three new subclasses. Uh, one of them is particularly interesting, the brawler, that I want to talk about. But you should pull that up so that we can take a look at it. Okay, yeah, I've I've looked at it before. So so Unearth Arcana, the playtest for D&D, has three new subclasses. One for the druid, one for the fighter, and one for the wizard. Definitely talk about first is fighter subclass. And the reason for that is is that somebody mathed it out and it's just mathematically in every way superior to the champion which get your hands off me you brute you brute which is um not surprising because the champion is not only the most boring subclass in standard fifth edition but also probably the weakest the brute is cool the brute the thing is what's really neat about the brute is that it it gives you the ability to obviously fight with your fists fight with different sorts of weapons and be effective if you're the kind of person who wants to, to hit people with a chair or something uh it, it definitely plays to the you know wwe wannabes if you really feel like making a, a luchador or a, a pro wrestler or something like that and his name is john c well this is exactly what we've been saying is that one fifth edition has a hard time making subclasses or martial archetypes that don't add spells or magical effects right to be interesting and i think this one does an an okay job um compared to so the third level ability for the champion the other basic ass fighter archetype right. is that they get better criticals the problem is a player is only going to feel the effects of that five percent of the time right right Whereas the Brute, the basic ability is you add a damage die to every single hit. So you get to feel how good you are every time you succeed right. and, at and, and, and a universal truth of role-playing games that D&D resisted for a long time is that rolling more dice is fun. Everybody likes rolling more dice. Everybody likes rolling extra dice, bonus dice. You know, but that's one of the cool things about Advantage is that it's rolling extra dice. And this just, you know, even if, well, mathematically it does work out better than the champion, but even if it didn't, it feels fun because you get to roll an extra dice when you're doing damage and everybody likes that. Yeah, I I think it's uh, a a better version of the champion. I don't know. I, I might let my, I would consider letting players combine features of the brute and the champion. Like Mm -hmm. if they really wanted the seventh level champion like paragon ability where you get to get advantage on athletics checks or whatever that is instead of brutish durability i don't i'm not sold on the name though the brute no i'm not sold on it either i don't somebody suggested on the the dnd subreddit that this might be replacing the champion uh in the same way that the new ranger replaced the old ranger but I don't think it does the exact same thing, so I'm, I'm not so sure I feel yeah, that. I don't think there's any reason for that. Um, it's two simple subclasses that accomplish the same thing. Right. Make players' lives easy, you know, at, at for, for playing a fighter, right? If you want to play mm-hmm. a straightforward fighter, boom, you're there. I mean, there's, there's no reason why... But yeah, mechanically, the brute doesn't match up with the way the mechanics can actually work, because... You could be an archer brute, right? right. And it would yeah. actually probably be really good. Yeah, um, absolutely. There's no reason why that would apply to, you know, the the description of brute applies to archery, but mechanically it totally does. Yeah, it, it, whenever you hit with a weapon that you're proficient with and deal damage, the weapon's damage increases by an amount, blah, blah, blah. So you could do that with a crossbow or a short bow or anything. So the the flavor of brute is a, is a little off. Uh, yeah, you could just be like an especially tough, powerful, survivable fighter. It's a great idea, or it's a great. I, I like I like the subtype, or I like the subclass. Uh, it, it it's just the flavor is a little weird, and it clearly outclasses the champion. Uh, yeah, which is not Power creep. S- something I care about a whole lot. Uh, 
But I guess if I had a player who was a champion, I would have to to deal with that. Well, I I feel like the champion has a big side on it that if you pick it, you're saying, I don't really care about this shit. I don't (laughs) care about being outclassed, right? Because there's, there's no reason why a player who cares about the nitty gritty mechanics of the game would ever pick the champion over the battle master the battle master just has so oh, many I, I, more yeah no things i see what you're saying you if if you want to if you really want to get into the 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 fun nuts and bolts of a fighter then yeah you're going to pick battle master uh, the the thing is like the base fighter class is very strong and has plenty of interesting things with action surge and second wind and fighting styles already even if you don't make a whole lot of use of the subclass so so champion is a perfectly viable choice but you're you're correct in that people are probably going to choose it for theme or simplicity down and dirty with things and they're gonna pick battle master anyway okay we've talked about talked about brute for a long time well i when i saw this uh, new release uh, you you went straight to the brute because you are you are a physical creature robert but me i live in the the world of <laughs> the ideas world of the mind. <laughs> and the mind and uh i'm also with my own homebrew was trying to make a technomancer subclass for the wizard. And here they are. Uh, they gave us a arcane tradition school of invention. And I was like, Oh, this is pretty cool. Wizards who craft magic items and magical power things. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, all right. All right. What do you get? What do you get? <laughs> Number one, tools of the inventor two two tool proficiencies. Okay. That's a thing <laughs> Two arcano mechanical armor. Okay, you're Iron Man, a wizard Iron Man. This sounds really neat. But then when you read it, it's so very limiting in that uh, you can only make this out of studded leather armor. (sighs) And I was like, wait a second. I was going to be a full plate wizard and you just ruined it. You ruined it. This is interesting because I made a similar uh, ability for my, um, uh, my artificer for 5th edition for Eberron. Uh, one of the, the options that they could choose was a magical suit of armor. But it was, you know, substantially more powerful, or it got more powerful. This... Well, it just it, goes it'll down... Give you like, it'll give you, like, a 15 AC, you know, which is... Which is, like, one lower than you would get if you cast mage armor on yourself? Yeah, exactly. It's it's not in any way... <laughs> You're fucking killing yourself to get resistance to a very rare damage type, force damage. Oh, does it give you resistance to force damage? That's something. It does. That's uh, something. It's, it's not... I mean, it's not great. Not going to come up a lot. I don't know. It's, it's, again, it's a cool idea. Wildly undertuned. But you can't expand on it, right? Oh, if, yeah, if that's, a, that's the, exactly what I was thinking, yeah. If you take the feat, like, heavy armor proficiency or multi-class into a class that gives you that, and you're like, all right, now I'm going to make a suit of half-plate arcano mechanical armor, uh, you, you can't do that. Specifically says you can only do it with light armor, and then there's nothing that builds on it. Nothing else in the class is like, all right, whenever you're wearing Arcano magical armor, you, you now have jet boots at level 10 or, you know, it, some other thing. It, it, it goes nowhere. Uh, the other basic ability, reckless casting, I just feel like is thematically way off. If you're an inventor, to me that says you have precise control over, like, what you're doing. And this feels like something that, like a wild sorcerer would get, just, you know, cast in spells and you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, without looking, doesn't this step on the toes of the wild sorcerer a little bit? Yeah, it, it totally does. And it also just seems like, uh, I, I don't really know why you would ever not want to know what spell you're going to cast. <laughs> I, I'm sure it leads to some fun play where you're like, all right, I shoot a, I'm going to shoot them. And then you cast light instead of why would you spend a, a spell slot to not know what spell you're casting? Why would you why wouldn't you just <laughs> cast a spell <laughs> that you already have prepared? Yeah, I <sighs> there, there are other types of inventor besides mad inventor, like not not every not every inventor is insane. Anyway, uh, to some school of invention, uh, 
cool ideas and themes. One of the abilities doesn't fit with that theme, and then the whole thing seems weak sauce. There's also a druid subclass for druids who like it's the, it's the fungus one, right? Yeah. yeah, which is good, and I'm happy it's there. I actually I like it. Definitely have an NPC that likes to decay things and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it's a super neat idea. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. advice matt that's right uh unwanted advice number two the most popular podcasting segment in dungeons and dragons history where we find people who have problems and tell them what to do whether they're dungeon masters or players we will fix your problems and we have a, a rich body of of questions to draw from because Nerds like to go on. Nerd, nerds like to go online to Reddit and N World and where else and say, "My group is doing something insane and weird. What do you suggest?" And then they yeah, get a bunch nope. of bad advice. Now they can get bad advice from us instead of randos on the internet. No one is safe from me. I am constantly trolling all of these forums. Not trolling. 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 Both. Trolling all these forums to find people who uh, have have questions are you ready for question i am i'm ready for a question uh to be clear i have not heard any of these things i don't know what the problem is question one i've been a dm for a group for a little less than a year now and i've had the same problem since day one my players aren't playing their characters i asked my players to write a couple paragraphs about their character their motivations, their background, their goals. I take these things and incorporate them into the campaign, but it's almost impossible for them to get involved once these elements show up in the story. One example, I have a player whose background involved being infected by lycanthropy by a group of specific wizards. Instead of being interested whenever a wizard of this order is cited, the player didn't do anything and instead allowed one of the other players to speak to this NPC. Despite his affiliation and this quest being personal. It isn't just personal stories that I have this problem with either. It's whenever they interact with the world around them, they always approach talking to NPCs very re reluctantly and only seem to like combat. Despite my wife, my wife, my wife, one of the players telling me that they don't really enjoy combat. I feel sometimes that they'd be better off just having no story at all involved and just I should just send wave after wave of monsters from the manual at them until they get bored. I don't know what I can do better uh, to better involve story elements and to get my players involved. It's draining me of my enjoyment in planning and running campaigns. Well, this is actually a uh, not at all surprising problem um, and one that you're going to hear from a lot of new and inexperienced DMs and GMs, I think. Um, I don't want to make any assumptions about this person. Do they give any background they there. said, I've been playing for a year now. Oh. Oh. It was a baby DM. Uh, this is no, this is not surprising at all. Look, this is a problem that you're going to run into a lot with new groups and groups that haven't developed a lot of cohesion yet and players who aren't used to role-playing. But the answer, I think, is right there in the post. It sounds like, and regardless of what one of his players told him separately, it sounds like the players would prefer a different type of game. It sounds like the players would like uh, something a lot more hack and slashy, maybe with some, uh, sure there's some NPCs and some story, but maybe a simple and easy to follow one, one that doesn't involve a lot of complicated roleplay. The other, I mean... Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta... Build your character. If if this is the type of game that you want to run with lots of story and role playing right. and stuff like that, you got to build your characters up to that, right? Right. Maybe it sounds like, like Rob said, they just want to play combat and explore and break down doors in a dungeon. 
you should build them a dungeon that does exactly that. But yeah, and we we, we talked about this some in, mysteries and story yeah. about the world around them. We talked about this in an earlier episode, maybe multiple times. But you you have to you have to choose your group carefully, and you have to adjust your game to the players that you have, and you have to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And the problem is obvious here. The obvious problem is that not everybody's on the same page. The DM wants to run a certain type of game, and the players want to run a certain type of game. If your players have a elaborate backstory that that they put together or that you put together and you you drop something in front of them and they don't take the bait that's fine it's disappointing it's not the end of the world but it, it suggests that maybe they're not that invested in that part of the game so tack left you know do something a little bit different put a different type of dungeon in front of them you know, it, it might be useful to to talk to your players and say, look, this is what I want to run. Let's be very clear about what type of game that you want to have. But it, it really sounds like the, the problem and the solution is is relatively clear. The, the players are indicating what kind of game they like to play. And then it's up to the DM to either run that game or find or adjust expectations or, or find a different group. Yeah, and 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 my advice is definitely the same as Rob in that uh, talk to your players. It sounds like there hasn't been any communication except some side communication with one player that you're close with, your wife. Uh, talk to your players about what they they want out of the campaign. Right, this character that has this complicated plot about being infected with lycanthropy and stuff like that. Maybe they don't want that and that's that's okay right um they enjoy combat and they enjoy watching their friends talk with npcs but uh they don't want to do that themselves yet and they'll get there eventually but it, it, it's okay that they don't want that the the other thing the the, the the sorry the example that he gave i'm assuming it's a he i gotta stop doing that the example that the the dm gave just off without again without knowing the circumstances if you put an NPC in there that you want to interact with a certain player, have them interact with that player, address that player by name, or have them, you know, find a way to, to draw out that player. That's something that I, that all DMs have to do, but that I have to do with my less talky players. If there's a circumstance where, you know, it's specifically something that they should deal with, that they want to deal with, make sure that you, you address that character by name, or you put something like that's very clearly designed for them to pick up on like right. if you've got a player that send that's, them a dream yeah. write them a letter maybe they're 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 shy about talking in the moment write them you know this npc has written them a letter that they can then just read in front of the rest of the group right right baby steps and it's not you know it doesn't sound like an insurmountable problem it's it's unfortunate that the dm is feeling burnout or or not enjoying prepar- preparation for the game and that is definitely something that needs to be dealt with but if the problem is that the players aren't interested in the type of game that that DM wants to run. Then you got to talk to your players or find a different group. Um, my, my one other piece of advice before we wrap this up is the letter writer says, you know, I ask my players to write a couple paragraphs about their character and their motivations, their backgrounds and their goals. You know, for new players, that's honestly probably not the best way to incorporate them into role playing. Having a backstory does not mean you know how to role play a character or Correct. play those things. These things are are two separate things. One one thing, I mean, I don't have my players write backstories anymore. They can if they want to, and many do. But what I usually do is have them answer a very short list of questions. Things like, "What's your motivation? Uh, who's an important person in your background? What?" is your ultimate goal what does success look like for your character you know broad questions that get them thinking about what drives their character to do what they do uh, and again w- this is the other thing that i talked about a lot is i always make sure that i have a question about why they would want to be a part of a group what right. what motivation do they have to be a member of an adventuring party and rather than having them write out uh you know a backstory which may or may not actually have any effect on how you role play a character you know it just you have them work on a set of motivations. So, but it sounds like this is a, a new DM, an inexperienced DM, dealing with, with the growing pains of a group, and I, I'm sure Your that problems they will... are normal and yep. solvable. 
I'm sure that they will come to an agreement. It may be a change in the membership of the the, the group. It may be taking a break from DMing, or maybe just it's a conversation about what everybody wants to do. But don't worry, letter writer, who we forgot to give a name to. Uh, these problems are, are normal and solvable, and I'm sure that you will get back to enjoying your game in no time at all. Okay, here's question two. It's a short one. I think it won't take us long to answer, but a strange one. So I'm DMing for the first time as part of what's eventually going to turn into an actual play-based game. It's going pretty well. My party, Barbarian, Rogue, Cleric, seems to be having a good time. I haven't played tons before, and the two campaigns I've played in, I've been a paladin and a rogue. So there's a point I want to get across, and I plant this cool NPC paladin in a magic shop run by a doddering old wizard for the PCs to run into. Do they decide to take... Her, the paladin, on the adventure? Nope, they take the doddering old wizard. I've never run a wizard before, and the little research I've done in the six hours since we finished playing makes it seem like such a finicky class. Should I try to find a local game store and play a session as a wizard? Just do a bunch of research? How do I run this guy? Thanks. Boy, this is a strange one for sure. (laughs) I know, right? Uh, (laughs) Matt, it seems like you have some opinions about this. I I have some thoughts. Well, yeah, sure. But go ahead. So and... I mean, this is obviously a DM who is is very new, right? right. Yeah. Um, and so this is some really basic advice: is that running NPCs, it doesn't matter what class they are, they're still people. Everyone is people, right? Um, you already have a great NPC that your players felt attracted to. You said they were a doddering old wizard. I'm sure. How you introduced this NPC to your players in some way attracted to them to having them tag along for the next part of this adventure. And that's perfect. So yeah, it, it, you already it also, know how to play it. it. If you've ever met an old person in your life <laughs> before, play them like one of those. It also seems a little bit like the DM was expecting to plant a DM PC in the party. Something yeah. I, I'm not sure... I'm not sure I've ever planted an NPC anywhere in any of my games and had the expectations that the players would say, sure, come come join our party and adventure with us. Uh, in fact, when I needed that to happen, I had to make it really abundantly clear that that that, that, uh, that NPC was going to, to travel with them. So that's right. a, a little... I, I just... I, I would like to know more about this person's game and what they're hoping to accomplish. So sidebar, yeah... Check your motivations. Make sure that you're not putting something in, this super cool paladin that really you just want to play. Um, That's not your job as the DM. But I I love what your characters have done in twisting your idea, and I think here's an easy, quick fix for you. Take this NPC's character sheet and put it on the table where your players can see. They know what spells the wizard has, And the players basically get to tell this NPC what to do. Bam, the problem of you not knowing how to play this wizard is solved. The players are like, cast a fireball for us. And the NPC does. Problem solved. Easy peasy. Best of luck in your actual play. I mean, my normal advice is to leave this to people who are professional (laughs) actors and improv The other thing... Maybe you are. The other thing that was a little bit weird about this is that it seems like the dm is especially concerned with the mechanics of a wizard which are a little fiddly compared to a rogue or a paladin i guess but not especially and also this is a common misconception but your job as the dm is not actually to know literally everything about the game uh in fact your job as the dm is first and foremost to run the game and make sure the story is continuing you know if if you want you do not have to adhere to the rules with, you know, razor sharp precision. Just get a general idea of what the wizard is going to cast, you know, two or three spells, and then cast them. I had a wizard in one of my games that only cast fireball. That was his little thing. That was his his tick. Is the only spell he had memorized was fireball. It also made it very easy to run that wizard. Right. NPC wizards don't aren't as good as normal wizards they may only know two spells right they may know fireball and the light cantrip well, they spent 50 years learning those things and they can cast them well let, let me tell you a secret if you put an npc in and it's a rogue or a, 
a wizard or a paladin, you don't know, you didn't expect it to have to do something. You don't have to know everything about NPC. You don't even have to know what subclass it is. Just make sure that you know what it, what that NPC's basic attacks or basic spells are, and and wing it. If you if you if you get bogged down, uh, letter writer, in all the needless minutia of things like this, uh, you are going to have an awful lot of trouble making it through the campaign. So learn where to not put a whole lot of, of effort in. It doesn't pay to try All the smart boys know why It doesn't mean I didn't try I just never know why Okay, next letter. This is a short and a weird one. I found this one buried on a form that no one had responded to. Um, so I'm excited. So this person needs us, Rob. This person needs our help. All right, I'm, it's I'm a, ready. It's a long letter. Are you ready? I'm ready. How old is it? Uh, are are I we have delving? No, I have no idea. It was. I got this like weeks are ago. Are we delving so. into the depths of time? Okay. All right, I'm listening. <clears throat> Let's go. Is it a good idea to let the player be Medusa? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the, the answer to that question is no It is not a good idea to let the player be Medusa Not to be a Medusa Not to be the Medusa uh, It's not a good idea to let the player base their their character on Medusa uh, I oh, oh wait, hang on Well hold on Let's let's roll this back, Matt, actually Yeah, so actually I think this player is right Be Medusa Medusa Technically, in Greek mythology, is a person, not a right. not a group of monsters. Right. Though, having somebody whose hair is snakes and turns people into stone in the party presents some logistical problems that that I'm not sure are, are going to be very easy to overcome. But that that makes me think. No, it's not a good idea to let your player be Medusa, but. If you were a particularly ambitious or bold DM and you wanted to run a monster campaign. Uh, in which every player is a monster, like an ogre or a Medusa or a Knoll or something else, then perhaps that would work. You would have to almost certainly create your world and your campaign from scratch. Because I am, um, Matt, maybe you can correct me on this. There's like absolutely no written modules where the players are monsters, unless you count something like the Goblin Adventure from from Pathfinder. I, I don't I don't think there are and so yeah you could do a huge rehaul of things but the first piece of advice I would give is ask the player why they want to be a Medusa right and it might just be that they want to be a, a weird outsider it might be that they want to turn people to stone all the time and that's something you'll have to say no to <laughs> um, but here's an easy solution for that. Is you're like, well, you can't be a Medusa because you can't be around anyone without turning them all to stone. However, maybe you're the daughter of a Medusa, half Medusa, and then give them the tiefling class and give them a, instead of, I think there's a variant out there that lets the tiefling cast like a one-third level spell a day and change that to... Flesh to stone, they get it at a higher level, and so they're half Medusa, and their powers are slowly developing. I would say the same thing if you wanted an all-monster party. A, a quick way to do that is like, oh, you want to be an ogre? Well, you're a half-ogre. Here's the half-orc. Right. Class. Exactly. So, short answer, no. Long answer is, depends on the player. Ask them why. Ask them why. I've got... Two more letters. Oh my and goodness! I think if we got two more letters. Quickly, All right, let's do two more letters. We can then. do this. Great. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready. Go ahead. Question. We got time. What's the best way to scam my party? I run a game with six players in D and D Fifth Edition who are currently making a long haul traveling across country. The next session I have planned has them meeting a traveling salesman who's offering magical items that are either ridiculous or completely detrimental in hilarious ways. The one problem is one of my players has the identify spell. What's the best way for me to earn his trust so he doesn't bother with the spell or perhaps convince him not to do so as the salesman? His version is ritual only, so I think having the party stand around for 10 minutes at a time waiting may help. But I worry he might check one item and the whole game will be up. This is 
a great question, and it is one that comes up a lot, especially if you've got a player that likes to use Detect Evil or Identify or or one of those spells that allows them to overcome you know, the the very obvious traps. There's a lot of ways to go about this, and I think the DM has already identified some of them. Uh, you know, it takes time. Maybe the salesman has an item that's particularly interesting or valuable, and the players aren't going to want to wait for it to be identified to put it on or use it or uh, apply it, and you can get around it that way. Uh, you can also... There's nothing saying that you can't make these items difficult to identify or... Uh, have some sort of non-standard spell placed on them that you know well, if they if they don't sufficiently roll on their identify spell uh, gives them a false positive. I would I would uh, steer clear from from saying that players who are trying to say is this thing weird or cursed and then you're like no it's not and then it is and then they're like well why couldn't I tell that right. There needs to be a good reason why they. Couldn't oh, tell absolutely. That. I would say, I, I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying if they ask, "Is this I'm cursed?" Cool. and they do their due diligence in checking that it's cursed. Here's my 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 advice: is one, ask your motivation for why you want to give your players a bunch of uh, hilarious or uh, cursed items. If you want to have a fun session where they have to deal with all that, I think that's a that's a valid thing. Uh, your way of giving them to them is pretty obvious uh, in a traveling salesman. Um, plus, there's no actual reward for your players. One solution is have this salesman. What is? Why is the salesman want to get rid of these items? Maybe he he can only you can only get rid of them if you sell them to someone else. The salesman to get rid of them also has one really great item that you know people in the party really want. He's only willing to sell them to all your players in bulk. There you go. A better way to plant cursed items is to actually have them as treasure in the dungeons. Players are much less suspicious uh, than a traveling salesman. That's true. That uh, your your players are going to be rightfully suspicious if somebody shows up with impressive or interesting magical items and offers to sell them at anything less than you know an exorbitant amount. Uh, so there may be a better way. Matt's correct, actually. Uh, examine your motivations. If you want this to be a, a fun little interaction, maybe instead of a traveling salesman, you come across a caravan that's been raided or or abandoned, and there's some interesting things there. Or you come across a corpse or something where it won't be quite so suspicious as some guy coming up and selling, you know, weird trinkets. As as narratively interesting as that is, your players are smart. They have also seen the same movies and read the same books, and so they're not going to take a uh, a salesman selling interesting or unusual things at face value. All right, we've answered two silly questions. I have one final question. It's it's more serious, and we should we should end on it because I think this is a common thing that lots of DMs need help with. You ready okay. for our last? I'm ready. One? I'm ready. I'm... All right. I'm not sure how to help my players learn to play Fifth Edition. As a bit of background, I've been DMing for a lovely group of players for a few months now. I've only DMed a few times before this, though I've played plenty of 5th edition as a player. None of my players has any real D&D experience with any edition before playing with us, so I've kind of held their hands through the process of playing. The problem is, I feel like I haven't really taught them to play well enough. I think I've held their hand too much, and I feel like they rely on me tailoring things to them. The issue is this is putting more stress on me as the DM, and I can't really explore ideas like I want to or use adventures. I'm not sure what to do from here. I think they only have the barest knowledge about the game, and I don't know how to guide them. The kicker is that I'm far too broke to afford all the books, something the authors of this podcast can identify with, so I can't just throw books at them. I don't know how much that would help either. At this point, I'm considering looking into getting a copy of the player's handbook somehow, but I don't know how to split up one handbook. Right now, we're using online resources to play for the most part. I'd appreciate any help on this. Well, one, like, bit of practical advice is that there's a pretty robust open source book for 5th edition, which has all of the 
the basic things. It doesn't have all of the classes, but it, it has all of the rules. So that by itself is something that you could print out and bind and give to your players or... Right, make one of your players who has a nice work printer print exactly. it out for you. Uh, Steal from your... Though we, we are jobs. sympathetic to the, the challenges of not being able to afford all the books, and that is an obstacle. But in terms of having them know what their saves are and proficiencies and uh, the nuts and bolts of their class, that's something that can easily easily be remedied. But let's get to the, the deeper question. Yeah. yeah, and here's my strategy for teaching brand new players holding their hands but so that they learn right is remember your job as the dm right is just to ask them what they want to do in a situation and then interpret their actions in the world through the rules occasionally right when things are risky and you need to roll some dice right what you should do is continue approaching playing with those players in that style. Ask them what they want to do, and then when a roll comes up, every once in a while you can tell them, oh, okay, you wanted to do this? Make an athletics check. You want to attack the goblin? You have to roll this and make an attack check. Pick and choose when you explain those things. And then take another approach where you have a goal for a session in like, oh, I want to accomplish this. I want uh, this fight to happen. I want to move the campaign forward here, but also have a rules goal for the session. Start simply, right? The goal for today is that players are going to be pretty familiar with the basic concept of you roll a die and you add a number. Next time, we're going to introduce how hit points and resting works, right? So make sure, just piece it out one at a time and make sure that this one rule for today is the one I'm not going to hold their hands with that I'm going to make them, uh, I'm going to explain to them as they do it. The other ones, we're just going to hand wave away. So piece yeah. it out. And the thing is, it depends, I suppose, a little bit on what your characters are playing, but you can set them, like Matt said, a rules goal and a very simple rules goal. I have a new player who plays a rogue and I, I have held her hand and I have been gentle with her because she's a, a good role player and she really enjoys the game but recently i have said you know i need you to know what your attack bonus is and i need to know you need to know what your what you roll to do damage and that was a, a just those two things was a great rules goal to set for her she now knows exactly like what to do to sneak attack and what she what happens you know when she hits and if you have a player who plays a wizard or a cleric or or somebody who casts spells to say i need you to just make sure that you know one or two spells in case combat is going quickly and you need something to cast. So, like Matt said, set set reasonable goals, you know, and, and maybe it'll be a few sessions before, or, or a few months, or even longer before a player has full grasp of everything that their character can do. But you should be able to get through the session with them having an idea of what they are capable of they'll be able to approach the problems that come to them with, you know, the confidence to solve them or at least try to solve them with the tools that are available. You can't expect too much. And if you just do it one step at a time, right, go through the, the basic rules. And really, there's only like 10 or so important rules right. to the game. And, uh, and fifth, break those ten out, and in ten sessions, your players will. Know fifth edition is is very intuitive. It doesn't always seem so at first, but you know, as as you know, make sure your players know their proficiency bonus, and then they'll realize that you know when they attack, when they roll a save, when they use a skill that they're proficient with, they'll say, "Oh, oh, I'm using my proficiency bonus," and then it will things will start to click, and it will start to make sense, and hopefully that will help them you know understand the system and their character a little bit better. Best of luck, new DM. You'll get there eventually. And that does it for Unwanted Advice. Unwanted Advice. advice. You're welcome. Uh, if you have questions for us, send us an email at dmofnone at gmail.com or you can message us uh, at Twitter at dmofnone. Let us know what your problems are. We will solve it.